Let's open our Bibles to the book of Zechariah, chapter 4. <clears throat> Last week we covered uh, chapter 3, and we've been going through the, the eight visions of uh, this prophet, Zechariah. This prophet of, uh, he's been referred to as, as the prophet of hope, because he's there to encourage the, the people, the workers, um, you know, especially these two leaders, um, He's there to encourage Joshua and uh, Zerubbabel. His, uh, his counterpart there, Haggai, which the book we covered a couple weeks ago, is all, also preaching there uh, during this time. And these guys are just there to encourage them. And I want you guys just to get a mental picture, picture of what's going on. They, they were in Babylon for 70 years. They're back. Um, a lot of them were young men capable of working. They, they were sent back to, to, to rebuild the temple, Solomon's temple there. But be aware that there, there's still Jew, there were still Jews in Babylon during this time. You know, you, you still got the, the book of Esther and, and all that to be written and all that. <clears throat> Daniel's probably still up there as well. So you, you have, uh, you know, a lot of people, they're working, uh, they're building the temple. A lot of them are discouraged. You know, they stopped working for about 16 years because of oppression from uh, the Samaritans, uh, from the surrounding uh, Gentiles there and... Uh, they they just went back home and now that they're uh, stirred up, there seems to be some sort of a revival. They're back working and and you have these two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, which means uh, God uh, remembers, in reference to God remembering His promises. These guys are there to encourage them. You know? So um, it's been said that they were discouraged because um, they remember, especially the older ones that had lived through the you know through the exile. They they compare the old uh, temple of Solomon how it was precious and just full of gold and, and they were barely just finishing the foundation on this temple and they're like I'm, I'm, these guys are probably thinking I'm going to die before we even finish this temple you know it said and I think in Ezra and Nehemiah it talks about uh, how some of them were just weeping and there's different views as far as commentators why were they weeping were they weeping with joy or just with discouragement so you have these two prophets that are here to encourage as well so we covered the last, uh, <clears throat> the last couple of visions, four visions to be, to be exact. Today we're going to cover the fifth vision, and this is found in, uh, in uh, chapter 4. It's only 14 verses. The previous vision was the vision of the high priest before the angel of the Lord. He was there. And you guys remember who else was there? It was sort of like a heavenly courtroom. You got uh, <clears throat> the angel of the Lord. You got Zechariah just zoning, honing into the, this this. Um, you know, this heavenly courtroom, you have the devil there be at the right hand of the high priest Joshua, and he sort of seems to be the prosecutor there, and you, got, you obviously got the God the Father there, and, and uh, his presence is, is there as well. But we see the interesting thing was that Joshua was dressed in dirty clothes. His garments were dirty. And the, the Hebrew word there was the, the worst word you can use for dirty. It was basically he was filthy with uh, excrement. He had a dirty diaper, says uh, Joe Foch. And uh, basically what that is in reference to is the sin of man, you know, the sins of the nation. The reason they went into Babylon, into discipline, was because they went into, got into idolatry. And now they're back. And we see that Satan there, the accuser, he's accusing them uh, before the, the angel of the Lord, before God there. And, uh, and then God says, you know, God basically gives them a makeover. He changed his robe. He gives them the, the, the vesture of the high priest again. They, they, they put on the turban and all that. And, um, and he reactivates them. He puts them back into the ministry. And that was a picture we talked about. We emphasize on how that was a picture of our salvation, how we come before God with our sins, and he cleans us. We can't give ourselves our, our make, spiritual maker over. He has to do it for us. And that there was a lot of application with that. You know? And then what else does he want? Well, he wants to put us into ministry. He cleanses us, gives us a bath, and then he puts us to work. And, and we saw how, what the privilege, how that was a privilege uh, with Joshua. So we see Zechariah, that previous vision, the fourth vision, focuses on Joshua, the high priest. Now he's going to focus this uh, fifth vision, the gold uh, lampstand and olive trees, is going to be an encouragement to uh, Zerubbabel. Okay? Zerubbabel, try saying that ten times fast. I don't, <laughs> you're uh, going to get tongue-tied there. <clears throat> His name means uh, out of Babylon or, or born in Babylon. So let's start here in verse 1. Uh, it's about 14 verses uh, long. It says, Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me, as a man who was wakened out of his sleep. 
Now these visions were not dreams. He, he might have been dozing off and coming, coming out of sleep back and forth. But he got eight visions during the same night. All these visions were just coming to him by this interpreting angel. It says, as is wakened out of his sleep. Look at verse 2. And he said to me, the, the angel, the interpreting angel here, What do you see? So I said, I am looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Verse 3, two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. I try to get pull up some images here, an artist's depiction of it. And basically, this is possibly similar to what he was looking at. So you got the, <clears throat> the menorah here, except it's got this, this uh, huge bowl up here. And what we can see, it's self-providing. The oil is coming from the, the, the trees there, the olive trees. And you, that's probably supposed to be a, the prophet there just looking at the vision here. And if, can we see, show the other picture real quick? This is another artist's depiction of it, of how, what, what he might have been seeing, how this, uh, this uh, lamp was just being self-sufficient from these, uh, these, these olive trees. And we're going to see some figurative language here, some symbolism, how it applied to them and how it applies to either the, the, the future, the future uh, uh, reference here as well, the olive trees. And, and we know seven is a number that stands for completion. God, you know, rested on the seventh day when he finished. So we see here where it says uh, seven, in verse 2b, <clears throat> stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Seven times seven is 49, so there's probably about 49 extensions of these, uh, these pipes going to the, the lamps. It says again in verse 3, two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. I do want to make a comment. Uh, the, the job of the high priest was always to care for the, the, the menorah here, the, the, the candlelight here. He was supposed to daily uh, fill it with oil, make sure it was clean, not let it go out. The fire was always supposed to be going there at the, at the, at the temple. That was his job. But here we see the picture, it's self-sustained. And again, if you don't know, oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Let's continue here. Verse 4, So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Notice the humility here. In other words, what are these, sir? <clears throat> He's got a teachable spirit. He's got a, a, an inquiry here. You know, a lot of times we, uh, when I talk to some people, maybe we, uh, you know, uh, we're going over a study or something, and and I ask them, you know, do, do you know what this means? And sometimes they 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 don't want to look bad or something, and they just they just say, yeah, you know. Sometimes we do that, right? We nod, but we don't know what's going on. And and this is always good, you know. The Bible says you got to have a, a teachable spirit. Sometimes we we just need a reminders. And he's honest here. He says, I don't I don't know what what this means. <clears throat> it says uh, <clears throat> in verse five. Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And it seems to be kind of condescending, but I, I don't think that's, that's a tone here. That's, that's my opinion, though. <clears throat> and I said, No, my Lord. Verse 6, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Okay, this, is, this was for Zerubbabel. Chapter 3 was for uh, Joshua the high priest. This is for Zerubbabel, the prince or the governor of the time there. It says, and this, this famous verse, I'm pretty sure most of you already have memorized, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Again, it was, it's a letter, it's a, a message of encouragement. Okay, so Rubo was probably tired. He was probably like, when are we going to get finished? Are, are we even going to get finished? He was just working uh, by his own hands. He was, you know, just using his own strength here. Chuck Smith says, it is extremely important before we engage in any work for God that we seek to discover the leading of the Spirit. The secret to any successful work for Jesus Christ is discover how the Spirit is moving and move with the Spirit, for it is not by might nor by power. And really that just goes back to godliness with contentment. You know, We're not going to be content if we are always um, comparing ourselves to the work of someone else. It always has to go back to, you know, is God working here? You know, what does God want me to do? We've we got to be content uh, with that. With that. And, and a lot of times we carry on too many burdens. We'll, we're going to overstress ourselves. We're, in a sense, we, we can burn out because 
we're focused on, you know, how much I can do, uh, and we're, we're putting too much on ourselves, and we got to remember, you know, just maybe God's not working there. Maybe I just need to stop and, and allow things uh, to die. He says, by my spirit. <clears throat> Again, Haggai chapter 1, verse 14 says, So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord, <clears throat> the Lord of hosts, their God. So you see there, the Haggai's prophecy there, and they preached around the same time, there was revival there. The people were being obedient, and it started with the leaders, and it was a Lord. It was a Lord. It goes back to the Lord's spirit, just uh, causing, uh, just igniting hearts to serve, serve him. You know, wouldn't you rather serve, uh, you know, with a joyous heart than just to serve, you know, going through the motions? I think it's always better to, to serve knowing that God's in control, that, you know, whatever ministry I serve in or not, it's, it's, it's God that's in control. And a lot of times we forget, you know, that, Everything we do as Christians, it's a ministry. You know, ministry, and I think the King James uses the word uh, uh, to serve. And, uh, you know, our wife, you're married, that's a ministry. If you've got children, that's a ministry. If you've got family, that's a ministry too. You know, and sometimes we, we need to prioritize that. And all that is ministry, and God wants us to remember that he's in charge of it, is by his spirit. There's a lot of ministries out there that we, uh, they, they probably should have been dead a long time ago, and we, we sort of have them on life support. We're trying to, to keep them going. I remember when I was doing the, the youth class and all that, I definitely, you know, well, I started this, you know, van ministry, so I'm going to keep doing it and make sure kids come and call them and this and that. But you know what? That's, that wasn't the deal. That, you know, God, God was like, well, it's over. It's not the time for that. And that's fine. You know, just allow God. Where God is working, that's where we should be at. I don't think God supports uh, dead ministries. <clears throat> Let's continue here. Psalm 127, one, one of my favorite verses says, Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. It always goes back to, to is God working here? Is God doing something here or not? Another ministry I was familiar with was uh, this one I, I called a uh, ZFH, which was zealous for him. And I was excited because, you know, the Bible says, you know, go out and tell people about Jesus, and that's cool. But you know what? It, was, it ended up just being me and another girl, and that caused problems because you want to avoid the appearance of evil, and, you know, you don't want to give a, you know, a, a bad image there. So and eventually we had to cut it off. And that's fine because if the Lord's not working there, I don't want to be working there either. But I think it always goes back to having that... that um, that uh, relational type of uh, evangelism, you know, it's got to be part of your life. It's got to be part of uh, your everyday atmosphere with the people you just share Jesus naturally. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be, well, I'm going to go up to strangers uh, at Harkins or whatever. You know, we, we, that's, we sort of make it religious sometimes. <clears throat> Let's continue here. <clears throat> Verse 7, who are you, O great mountain? <clears throat> Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. Who are you, O great mountain? Here, the mountain is referring to great obstacles. Zerubbabel had a great obstacle before him, or else he saw it as a great obstacle. He's like, how are we going to, again, how are we going to build this temple? How are we going to make it like it used to be? He was thinking of I instead of, 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 of God. He was thinking of I instead of the I am, for that matter, right? <clears throat> but that's a good question. How do we remove or handle paramount obstacles? How, how do we take care of, uh, you know, um, Troublesome things. And I think it always goes back to faith. And that reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 17. He says, So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, I have not seen any Christians move any mountains, any, in either I've never read in any literature, or seen it myself, and I don't think that's really ever going to happen aside from Jesus Christ, you know, uh, when he steps on earth. But, you know, obviously we know it's talking about great obstacles. We can move great obstacles with faith, you know, and faith in Christ. Who is the object of our faith? It's Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Someone said, faith is, not, faith is not like gasoline which runs out when you use it, but like a muscle that grows stronger as you use it. Someone else said, Fear can keep us up all night, but faith makes one fine pillow. 
See, faith uh, levels mountains. And again, the, the, the theme here is encouragement. And um, here, uh, the prophet, the, the angel, the Lord is trying to give the prophet a message so the prophet can give it to Zerubbabel and tell him, hey, there's a problem before you, how you might see it as a problem, but God's going to take care of it. You know, you just got to have faith in God. And if you guys were here, if you guys joined me to the series, through the series, uh, I'm not sure, I forgot what I called it, but it was a series on faith. And I'm sorry, we're going to give you a recap here. <clears throat> and I'm going to give you uh, four examples of faith. And I'm going to use four uh, biblical characters. And we're going to start with David. You remember David? David, giant's faith. And the series was called the Unwavering Faith. And I remember. But let's start with David's giant faith. Who was David? David was a kid, right? We know uh, from the Bible that he loved God. He, he, he you know, meditated on God's word. He's had some previous history, taming lions and, and this and that. You know, and, and we see that God chooses this young man to, to do great things. He defeated the first Iron Man. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, uh, someone you might know on TV. The first Iron Man was, uh, you know, the Iron Tank, Goliath, right? He's a gruesome beast. He was a giant. And he went up against this man boldly. Why? Because he had a giant faith. He was a mountain for David, right? No, actually, he was not a mountain for David. It was an unfair fight because... David had a greater faith. David uh, had God behind him. If God is for us, we can be against us, right? It always goes back to faith. 1 Samuel 17 says, You come to me with a sword, <clears throat> with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. That's boldness, that's confidence, that's faith, right? He had faith in, some, in God's word, something God had previously revealed to him. How could he have all this boldness if God had not already prompted him, uh, given him some sort of a faith, some sort of confirmation, confirmation that he, he would give him the victory? And here, the same thing is happening back in Zechariah. The prophet, he's giving Zerubbabel some faith. He's giving him a promise, but he has to trust in the word first. If he trusts in the word, if he has faith in God's word, he's going to be able to face any mountain uh, that comes before him. So we know that giant faith relies on what God can do, not man. And that's a good reminder for all of us. Now let's go to the second one, Enoch. Enoch's walking faith, right? Enoch was the guy, I would say, he was tight with God. He was the tightest man uh, with God that er, I think ever was because he didn't die. He, he just, God just, the Bible says that he walked with God and then he didn't. He just took him. You know, the, the book of, uh, uh, where we find the story of Enoch, it's not that long. It's, it's a pretty short chapter there. Enoch. Hebrews 11.5 talks about, the, about him, though, in the Amplified Bible. It says, Because of faith, Enoch was cut up and transferred to heaven so that he did not have a glimpse of death, and he was not found because God had translated him. For even before he was taken to heaven, he received testimony still on record that he had pleased and been satisfactory, satisfactory to God. Enoch's walking faith, right? Pleasing the Lord. Let's have another example here. Elisha. You're familiar with Elijah. Well, some of you might have not heard of Elijah, but this guy did the most miracles in the Bible, only coming second to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Elijah. He had a fully committed faith. And what I like about Elisha is that, you know, when he's called, he's, he's a working man. He's a regular guy. He's just working with the oxen, plowing the fields there, or whatever he's doing. And then Elijah... Comes by, he throws his robe there, and he's like, follow me, right? And, and Elisha, he doesn't hesitate. He, he starts chasing after Elijah, and he's like, let me say goodbye. And he goes back home. He uh, throws a big barbecue. He burns all the, the oxen. He, you know, he probably cooks him and celebrates with his family. And you know what he does? What his faith does? His faith causes him to, to burn any bridges that will cause him to go back. Anything that would tempt him to go back, apart from the calling that the Lord had given him, he gets rid of it. And that, and that was just an awesome, that, that's what I call the fully committed faith. He had a big barbecue with his family and follow the Lord there. And that's the, kind of, that's the kind of faith God wants. He wants us to have giant faith, walking faith, a fully committed faith. I'm going to give you four of the miracles that he did. He's known for parting the Jordan. He brought people back to life. One guy, he, uh, he brought him back to life accidentally. He caused the she-bears to defend them against a dangerous crowd of young men. He's the guy that was bald, 
Some, uh, you know, some people make it out to seem like there are young kids, innocent kids just making fun of him because of his bald head, and, and he just calls the uh, bears out and he tears up the kids apart. No, well, the young men can be anywhere from, you know, they can be in their early 20s, and they could have been a lot of, a lot of them. You know, they, could, they were probably taunting him because they were going to hurt him. Read into that. <clears throat> he caused blindness on a whole army. Somebody once said, those who God uses the most are those who hold on to the least. You know, and God wants us to just let go of things. Sometimes he, he wants to take you somewhere, but, you know, he wants to give you something, but you've got to extend both of your hands out. We're too busy holding on to what we already have. And God's not going to use us like that if we don't let go and allow, let go and let God. Hey, that's, that's probably where that comes from. And the fourth faith I have here is a fireproof faith between Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Abednego, there you go. Fireproof faith, and if you're familiar with them, they have a fireproof faith because they chose to be in the fire with Jesus rather than the shade without him, right? Fireproof faith, you know? This kind of faith moves uh, mountains. Any opposition, no matter how big it is, will move mountains. And this is the same message he's trying to relate to Zerubbabel here. Whatever mountain it is, it's not big enough for God. Don't worry about it. Be encouraged. Continue to build. If you're in the ministry, continue to build. Don't be discouraged because of you, you might not see some growth. You know? Be faithful. Let, allow God to do it. Let's continue to finish the verse here. It says, And she, he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. And here's another uh, encouragement. When the capstone was put on, that means that's the last thing you put on. When you're done building, the capstone is the last thing you just place on the temple there. He's basically telling, reiterating again, look, this temple is going to be built, and you're going to be the guy that's going to be putting the, the capstone on there. Right? He's confirming. It's going to get done. Don't worry about it. You know, we're, we're God's, uh, you know, I, I, I would like to move out of here pretty soon, and we're looking into that, you know, but we're, we're, we're waiting or whatever. I'm, I'm waiting on, on the other line to, so they can get back to me. But again, it's on God's timing. It always goes back to God's timing, not on mine. <clears throat> Let's continue here. Philippians 1.6 says, <clears throat> Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And this is an application to, uh, to our salvation here, right? It's also a work. God confirmed to uh, Zerubbabel that he was, he was going to finish the physical work, right? But God confirms to us that he's going to finish the work of, of our, you know, our, our walk with him, right? He's faithful. He's working in us. He's shaping us, molding us. Again, Philippians 1.6 says that there. Let's continue in verse 8 now. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Again, he's getting all, you know, he's getting uh, uh, visions here at night. I will tell you, though, that I think uh, J. Vernon McGee, he doesn't see eight visions. He actually counts ten visions, if you're familiar with, with his uh, commentary there. Verse 9, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Do, do you see that? The, the evidence there? The evidence of God's word is the fruit of doing God's word. You know, put it to the test. It's been said that, uh, you, you guys heard that, uh, that one saying, you know, the, how's it go? <clears throat> well, the, the, the verse says, taste and see that the Lord is good, right? But there's another saying that says, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating of the pudding. That's actually how it originally started out to be, and then we sort of changed it, made it shorter, made it sound better. But it actually started out like this. The proof of the pudding is in the eating of the pudding. And unless we get to work, unless we put to test God's work, we're not going to see the evidence of it. If, imagine if Zerubbabel and the people stopped working. They were never going to see the promises of, that God had for them. It's like we went over on John 13 several uh, weeks ago. In John 13, 17, it says, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Notice how it doesn't say, if you know them, blessed are you, right? It says, if you do them, right? It's in the eating of the pudding, right? It's in the, it's in the doing of these work. And this is where we get the evidence, the, 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 the faith, and going back and doing what God has called us to do. And that's where the real blessing uh, comes from. Now look at verse 10. Verse 10 is another, another uh, uh, big verse here that a lot of expositors talk about. <clears throat> verse 10 says this, For who has despised the day of small things? Who has despised the day of small things? And this is in reference to, uh, 
to uh, you or I uh, in the work that we're doing, we might sometimes we think that we're just doing we're not doing something very important here. And this guy is the ruler who was probably thinking, well, I'm just putting one stone over another. We're never going to get done, right? And it might be small right now, but it's going to turn into a bigger thing. It's got there, there's a bigger recompense for it. The same way you were, you serve in children's ministry or you serve in anywhere well, where you are not basically in front of people, where you're not really you know uh, ministering to other people uh, publicly. It doesn't matter. It might be one of the the small things here, but to God it's still the same. It says, "For who has despised the day of small things?" You know, God works through the small things. It's sort of like a, a preparation. You know, God, you'll be surprised to know that God doesn't start you off where you want to start. He'll start you off where he wants, where you need to start, for that matter. You know, I started children's ministry. I started teaching Bible study. Eventually, he put me over the children's ministry, and then eventually he put me over a church. Uh, okay, I get it. I can apply to that. Chuck Smith has a similar story. He says, God is laying the foundation today for what he will one day accomplish in your life. Don't despise the day of small things. God starts us out in little things. I start, started out teaching Sunday school classes. Then I was advanced to teaching and leading youth. Youth groups started out in small things. Too many people despise the small things. But if you're not faithful in the small things, God will never, God will never be able to raise you up to the bigger things. Don't despise the days of small things. Whatever it is that God has called you to do, Get in and do it for the glory of God. And if you are faithful in the little things, then God will make you ruler over bigger things. And that's a reoccurring theme in, in our lives. Chuck Smith again talks about this guy that, that, that approached him one day, and he's like, Chuck, I, I, I think the Lord's been prompting me to serve. And Chuck's like, okay, talk to Zach. He's in charge of the, the youth ministry. And I was like, oh, oh, well, actually, I was thinking if uh, you're ready to retire, uh, I can you know, step in for you. And, you know, it, it's really... I don't know. I think he's probably joking around with that. But, you know, it makes a lot of sense. You know, God puts us where we should be put because he's trying to raise us up to where we should be at. The men and women he wants us to be. He's, it says, uh, back to the verse here, it says, For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the house, in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven, again, Seven is a number of completion here. The plumb line is referring to measuring here. It means a work in progress. You're not going to take out a plumb line unless you're ready to build something. And this is another encouragement. To us, it might not mean a lot, but to them, a plumb line meant that work is going to get done. We're going to get somewhere. A lot of times, our perspective is we have a, a short plumb line. We got a, a short plumb line, and we think this is how far God wants us to go, when in actuality, God has a great has a long path for us to go and, and we're sort of um, you know not allowing God to work we come against God when we put our own strength into, thing, into, into things and not allow him to, to take us where, where he wants, us to, uh, wants to take us another thing I usually say is you know God will only take you as far as you want to go he only take you as far as you want to go and it reminds us that you know when God gave Joshua <clears throat> the, the land there he said, you know, whatever, wherever your foot treads upon, that's going to be yours. And you know what? They only took about one-tenth of what God had given them. They could have taken more, but they only took about one-tenth. And that's kind of like the Christian life. We don't take advantage of everything God has given us either. We, we lack the faith there. David Gusick says, even as an entire generation of Israel died in the wilderness, so many Christians die in the desert dryness of dryness of spiritual experience, never walking in the fullness of what God has for them, and that's a sad thing. You know, I think uh, I think God, you know, He's omniscient. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He can see our lifespan, and in our lifespan, this uh, spiritual plumb line, if I may, you know, we're supposed to get from here to here to the day where we get our glorified bodies, right? And you know, we as Christians, especially me as a sinner, you know, I'm gonna go, be going up and down, up and down. You know, hopefully, I'm progressing. You know, especially since I'm, I'm your pastor here, but you know. God sees where we're going to get to. And it's, I think Paul referred to it as a race. You know, I finish the race. And God wants us to keep on moving, keep pressing on forward, reaching people for Christ with the gospel, reaching, reaching others. You know, every believer here is an encouragement to see that. You know, you're learning, you're, you're growing. God's speaking to you. Let's continue here. 
the seven that we were talking about, it says, they are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Again, completion seven, God has a perfect knowledge. He's aware of everything. He's aware of what's going on. Verse 11, then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches? Notice how he condenses his question here. He doesn't allow the angel to answer him right away, and he just changes up the question. You got two trees, and then you got two branches. These special branches that, are, that actually oil is pouring out into this bowl from these two branches from both left and right. It says that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains. Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. And it's been said that the two anointed ones here in that time, the ones he was speaking to, <clears throat> was Joshua, the high priest, and uh, Zerubbabel, the governor. Or, you know, he was from the, the kingly line there. So you have these two guys, these two leaders that were to raise up uh, Israel. They were to lead Israel. Uh, Joshua and the spiritual matters. Uh, Zerubbabel in the more civil matters, nonetheless, it was all supposed to be a godly leading. And again, if we go back to not by my might, not by my spirit, it all goes back to God's spirit, uh, you know, and enabling them, empowering them to, to do this. Not by might, not by force, not by brains or bronze, but by, by God's uh, spirit. The two anointed ones, uh, that actually literally says, Sons of oil. So anointed means your sons of oil. Back then when, uh, when you were anointed, they, were, they wouldn't just like today, you know, we put a little bit of oil. Like Gail Irwin was saying, you know, if you see a guy, uh, if you saw a guy back in the day that was all just drenched in oil, he said, uh, you know, somebody loves that guy because he just basically just pour a bunch of oil on him. And that's how it was. You know, they were anointed ones. And these anointed ones are the ones anointed by God <clears throat> to, to be used for great ministry. Right? That's a, the, the specific application that they got here these uh these two trees here again the holy spirit is the oil so how do we apply it today well the holy spirit pours into us we are you know we're the church jesus christ fulfills these two ministries though perfectly because he's the high priest and he's the king of kings so you can see it in that sense as well we see many pipes here also also the two witnesses are in reference remember it's got a it's got a practical application and it's got a future application. The two witnesses, maybe it's Moses and Elijah, maybe it's Enoch and Elijah. I think it's Elijah. I'm not sure about the second one, but Revelations 11, 3, 4 says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, there you go, and the two lampstands which stand before the God of the earth. So we see some future application as well. So in their time, in 520 B.C., it was Joshua and Zerubbabel, and the future is going to be uh, Elijah and some other guy, maybe Moses, maybe Enoch. I don't know. That's a future application of the prophet here. Again, that's what we see here. But as Christians, you know, we can't do nothing apart from God. Jesus said, you know, apart from me, you can do nothing, right? Apart from Jesus, right? And we see here the trees, and we see the branches. Again, John tells us that we're branches, and apart from Jesus Christ, we can't do anything. Matthew 5, 14 and 16 says, You are the light of the world, and why do you need oil? They didn't have batteries. They didn't have flashlights. They needed oil to burn up in order to show the, you know, the, those that were around them, right? We need the same oil if we're going to be the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Again, you know, the, the Jews, they were supposed to be the light of the world, but they failed at it for a moment. And this, we're, this is a long moment because we're still waiting for them to come back to the Lord. Again, we in the church age, we're supposed to be that light, and we are being filled by this, this oil. You know, we're supposed to be anointed by it and, and be the light of the world. I see three things here, back from this verse in Matthew 5. We are light bearers for God. We are meant to be seen, okay? It's not secret Christians. It's not, uh, you know, 007 uh, Christians, uh, you know, incognito Christians. No, we're supposed to be seen. We're meant to be seen by all. We're supposed to uh, 
um, be the light. Philippians 2 says, Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Not outside of the crooked and perverse, not outside of the world, but in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that it, I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. What are we to do in the midst of the world? Shine. As what? As light. And you can't shine without oil. You can't shine without the Holy Spirit. Number three thing I see here, light bearing takes work. It takes work. Well, how do I know that? Back in Matthew, Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Light bearing has to do with doing works. It doesn't just mean saying, telling somebody, God bless you, Jesus loves you. No, it has to do with good works. Sometimes we got to go pray over people. We got to, you know, I, I basically subdivided, you know, bear with me here. I, I subdivided into two, two ways, okay? Uh, by guarding and engaging. What do we need to guard? We need to guard our tongue. We need to guard uh, our tongue from cursing, from gossiping, from complaining, Okay. We need to guard our actions, you know, guard ourselves from, you know, these things that tempt us. My problem might not be your problem, but I'm pretty, I know my problem and I know you know your problem. Stay, stay on guard. Guard your mind. Again, we don't just guard, but we engage. Three ways of engaging. Do kind deeds, pray for the lost, and share the gospel. You know, simple stuff. And sharing the gospel doesn't, you know, it's not just about, you know, on Facebook or texting somebody. You know, it sometimes those opportunities are going to be open and we've got to be faithful and step, step through them. And this is the last point. By guarding and engaging, uh, we uh, reflect Christ. And that, that sort of, you know, that, that's the end of the message. And there's many other prof, uh, visions that he's going to give us. We're barely down to the fifth one. And he's going to continue to give them to us and there's always going to be application to us. The most application I saw from this was that it goes back to the oil. It goes back to God. Uh, and his might, not us. So let's uh, finish up in prayer here. Gracious Father, Lord, uh, I thank you because um, you sustain us uh, by your spirit, Lord. You watch over us, Father, and uh, you have a, a perfect plan for our lives, Lord, and uh, we just want to be a part of it. Father, I ask that you would continue to be with us, that you would just strengthen us, we want your spirit. We want to be the, the leading of your spirit, Lord. If there's things in our lives that we might have, we might have on life support that you might not want us to uh, sustain anymore, please uh, help us to, uh, to acknowledge that and not be stubborn, Lord. Just let go and let you take control, Father God, of our lives. Help us to worship you now in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand together.